Hi friends, so today's video again is using wet specimens, so animals, well biological material preserved in alcohols, so this is not a live fish and I will say that this fish has not been killed or um, for the purpose of making the video or for the purpose of making a wet specimen, it was simply handed to me and so this video as I said is about the arowanas and here in front of me, this is a pearl arowana, um, Scalera pages giardini. So this is one of the cheaper species, but there are so many and they can reach, um, especially the Asian arowana, which is Scalera pages formosus, I think it is, and that can reach like 10,000 or more. They are can be expensive fish, but they can also be cheap. You can pay about 250, 450 for an individual. So anyway, so Sclero Pages Giardini was described in 1892 by Savile Kent and this species, the name refers to Sclero Pages means the knotting, the, so it's just generally referring to the patterning on the body of the fish, the scales specifically. So if I zoom in, we have to see a bit better, bear in mind that this fish has been preserved in alcohol so, and there, I think there's a few scale losses or weird patterning from the alcohol. But, so there will be the exact colour, they aren't this dark in person. So that refers to the large hard scale. So it looks like a mosaic, hence Scalero pa pages. And then um, Jardine refers to a Australian colonist. Um, and I assume it's Giardini rather than um, or oh, um, any other sort of way of pronouncing it, just because I assume it's French origin and Giardini rather than Giardini. Well, I'm not really sure. I've never trying to work out to pronounce it. Isn't exactly easy to find. Anyway. So this species originates from Indonesia, Papua New Guinea and Australia. So Scalera pages generally is Australian and there are other arowanas in the same grouping, not uh, Scalero pages that originate from other places. There's South American um, osteoglossiforms and there's also African. Uh, so they are widespread but Scalero pages is restricted to Asia and I would say the um, Australasia, Oceania continent. This species grows uh, from 90 centimetres to 100 centimetres, so that's one metre standard length, so that's from the tip of the head to the end of the caudal peduncle before the caudal fin. So that's this measurement here. So I wouldn't say that total length is that vastly different, the tail isn't particularly long. The alcohol has caused it to sort of like do that, it looks a bit clamped, and if I extend it's just going to break, so I'm not going to sort of show it off, but you can kind of do it pectorals a little bit, you've got to be careful because it can break the membrane. Anyway, so this species occurs in still water, streams and swamps, close to the, um, the edge, aquatic and um, repairing vegetation, hanging vegetation, so they occur more in slower waters. And this would likely um, correlate with where there's more nutrients, so there's more food for herbivorous species, therefore more food for carnivorous species, so there will be more fish and invertebrate diversity. It's also a good place for many species to retreat to. So a lot of species will go towards the edges, towards the plants, just because that's where they can hide easily from predators. Also on top of that is that gives these fish good cover and this is where insects above the waterline will occur and also birds and mammals and as we know these fish can jump and they can jump well so they can get any food but, um, that's above the waterline and generally there is higher nutrients because it's not really swept away as quickly in these sort of uh, lower water and um, low velocity waters. This species is, I would say, very much a product of its diet. Some are more of a product of their um, habitat, I find, but it's really difficult to say. So 
the difference this species clings to the surface so if I zoom in you can see that this fish is extremely flat at the top so it most likely will hover here with good eyesight generally to look above and around looking for prey and also at this size they're going to get eaten by other fish they're still all fish are generally also prey not just predator the mouth points upwards and this means this is a superior mouth so superior points upwards inferior points downwards uh, and then terminal points forward so this fish is feeding from the surface and I can open the fish's mouth out if I zoom in a little bit there we go you can see he's got quite sharp teeth almost just about and it's an upwards pointing mouth of quite difficult to open but these mouths can open quite large so these fish are feeding likely from the surface um, and above the surface so the mouth of the prey generally I would say reflects that it's eating probably large prey it won't be probably eating as frequently but maybe infrequent prey success these fish I would say are more ambush predators than you know chase down and hunt generally they don't suit you know very fast swimming although they can be known to swim pretty well they will be ambushing say from below the water to something above the water and they are pretty good at jumping the pectoral fins I think really aid in this they are like if I bring this fish up it's, they're a bit like gliders, so it might be easier from below. But you can see here, they get bit, well, they're easy to see on a live fish or one that's not been preserved. This allows the fish to give a bit more lift, and I find the tail being, um, they're not paired, the, um, these aren't paired fins, they're a lot larger. I think give the fish the lift out of the water. This, it's sort of the machine that pushes the fish and then the, the pectoral fins keep the fish up and then these little there's little ventral fins little tiny ones at the side and their dorsal fin is quite far back so it's probably just to give this fish so it's not as well seen from above and that fin isn't really needed to slow them down it's more to push the fish upwards I assume or steer it so generally this fish has, I would say, it's just mostly, it seems about, you know, surface feeding and lift. These fish are also streamlined, this does give them an ability to move quite fast, but I wouldn't say that this is, that's the major way of predating. Just by looking at the fish, this, I'm building these assumptions, there is also a very, um, if I zoom in, you're, actually this side might be easier. There's the lateral line. So this is the lateral line here. It's a series of pores on the fish. And these are sensory. So these are pits that can detect pressure and changes in the water. And this will probably allow the fish to detect other, well, food, anything moving around in the water. So that gives the fish, well, it can see the world around it almost and generally I don't quite a few fish have these but some are generally reduced to the upper end and as we go towards the head can't see any pitting but a lot of fish do have pitting around the head and it's quite bony so this is probably I would say somewhat defensive also giving the fish strength but it is very a bony plated head. So I'm going to zoom out again. So behaviour, these fish are extremely territorial, they are ill tolerant of each other, which makes them sort of, well, they're not really, they don't do well together, they will bash each other and they prefer just a solitary lifestyle so a healthy fish will most likely be one that's on its own um, the more fish is battered by another the more it will result in um, injuries they will result in um, more infections and also the immune system will be reduced 
And generally this fish will eat anything that eats, uh, fits in its mouth. Due to sort of predatory lifestyle, they're not hunting in packs. Um, their hunting isn't social, so they won't really benefit off a social predatory behaviour from others around. Regarding other fish, they are predators, they are piscivores, um, insectivores, they're generally just predators, so they will eat anything that fits. Um, I've looked after one that will swipe anything that moves below um, until he's completely used to them, even if they're practically like half his size and well too big for him to eat. Another thing to note about this fish is, like, is that they are mouth brooders and a lot of people wouldn't realise that when looking just at them. So generally the female will lay the eggs, um, male will fertilise them and then he will pick them up, up in his mouth I believe. And he will care for these oh, until they're mature, sorry, I wasn't looking at where I was zooming. What's interesting actually is they follow a different mo mode of sexual determination compared to a lot of, well compared to mammals and compared to quite a few fishes. So these fish do, instead of XY chromosomes, so males having XY and females having XX, these fishes display ZW. So the females are will be ZW and the males will be ZZ. So the ma females have two different chromosomes whereas the males have two of the same so it's kind of reverse and this is also seen more like famously in birds and butterflies so these are a primitive group of, well they are a primitive group of fishes the species themselves aren't primitive to say because these species themselves won't have been the same ones that were back all that time ago. They will have evolved since all species are equally as evolved, if you get what I mean. They will evolve for what's around now, um, even though they will be displaying primitive features that have been successful for so long. So, Scleropages and Giardini. Um, Scleropages Giardini and Scleropages Lichuratidae. Um, diverged from the eight other Asian species during the early Cretaceous so that's 145 to 100 million years ago and that's a, so these species as a group the, two, the pair have been around a long time and they are pretty primitive featured if you go I mean especially this bony head is a real sign a lot of primitive fishes um, in this group really have that sort of bony structure and I've, this is one group I've never really studied but they so these two diverged when the dinosaurs went extinct 65 to 66 million years ago and they're members of the family Osteoglossidae which includes the South American arana and the Osteoglossiforms which includes the African knife fish Xenomistus nogari um, the Aphanifish, Gymnarchus uh, nilo, niloticus and the African butterfly fish which is Pantadon uh, bolcholzi. So they are pretty, well they're with some of the older fish, I've got Xenomistus nigawa in here, they probably won't come out and they look quite different apart from this mouth, they share that sort of hinge mouth I'd say that brings forward there. And that makes them quite different from South American genotiforms, um, true knife fishes. But they are these are an interesting fish. The problem is, is they do grow so big, they produce a lot of waste. Um, being the size they are, they are predatory, they are territorial. They are in high demand though, and this is because generally, if you look at um, oh, the scale just came off. Um, if you look at um, the folklore, the uh, uh, sorry, Scleropages formosus, the Asian arowana, and I believe the Baltic uh, Batic arowana is associated with the dragon in specifically more Chinese folklore, and this is generally just sort of like a vague aesthetic association, which means that they are treated as good luck, a sign of wealth. But this has led to a insane demand for the species. 
So Formosus is protected in the wild, it's CITES Appendix 1. It requires um, a it requires a certificate and a microchip to be traded, I believe over international borders, but I'm not entirely sure. But generally they would be microchipped and protected. Um, so this means that there a lot of the other species I find are popular when people can't afford or don't want to pay for the Asian arowana. I think this species, the pearl, is just as beautiful. I don't think they're nearly as threatened. And they, as an adult, this fish does look really impressive. I would say it looks practically the same as... It depends if you want the bright red coloration of the Asian arowana, then that's really... I guess that's what a lot of people want. If you want the body shape and the behaviour, then other species are available. Obviously there's a silver, um, which is a South American species, I can't remember the scientific name. It's not scleropages. That grows a lot larger. It's arapaima, that grows to like, what, three metres long? So there's a lot around, but they're... There's like, you pay £50 for a silver that grows to two metres um, when you could probably save that money and set up for a Asian. Anyway, so I'll probably finish now. Uh, thank you for watching. Most of these comments are more my observations of, generally observations of the anatomy of the fish. Um, yeah, so... It might not be entirely right, I guess, but it's more observations of anatomy and how they act. Anyway, thank you for watching.